Well, good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Uh, just in case you're new to the program, each week what this is all about is that Mother Angelica years ago invited me to be the host of this program to help people tell their journeys of faith and how the Holy Spirit has opened their heart first, or usually first, to a deep walk with Jesus Christ, and then often totally unexpectedly an openness to the Catholic Church. And our guest tonight, I, I'm thinking that's a story I'll find out in a moment, is R.J. Snell, former evangelical Protestant. He's the director of the Center on the University and Intellectual Life at the Witherspoon Institute. And uh, R.J., it's great to have Thank you on Thank you so program. much. Good to be here. I know you're the editor of a book. We'll talk about that in the second half of the program. It has to do with converts to the church. It right? does. I like to hear people's stories. and I, I, I benefited a good deal from hearing others, and I would like to share that as well. Yeah, the problem with that is it's kind of like when I've been asked to tell my conversion story after I've interviewed a gazillion people is I can't, I start to wonder, wait, was that my story yeah, or somebody right. else's? <laughs> you appropriate other people's events as if they're your own. There you go. Sure. So let me back out of the way and invite you to start us from the beginning of your journey. Well, thanks so much. Delighted to tell the story. So I'm Canadian. Uh, I was born in the Canadian prairies in what was something of the Bible Belt of Canada. You know, Canada is fairly secular uh, yeah. outside of Quebec. You have some mainline denominations still, but this little piece of Alberta where I grew up had Prairie Bible Institute, which was the school that I went to. It was a great missionary school, non-denominational. That's where I went through school from third grade on. Uh, and it was a sort of school where you had Bible class every day, chapel every morning, and the goal was to make missionaries to send around the world. My home yeah. church was a little Baptist church that my grandfather had helped saw the wood and lay the cornerstone on. They were German Baptists. Although the story I was told is that when they left Russia, they, they were German-speaking Russians, that they were Lutherans, and when they went to the Dakotas, there was a pretty daughter of a Baptist minister, <laughs> and suddenly they were Baptists and continued yeah, moving on. I was wondering, German Baptists, I was trying to figure that out, because it doesn't really connect in my mind usually, but... Yeah, German, German Baptists, fundamentalists, non-political uh, very serious, devout, simple people, Bible-believing, the sort of church that even well into my, my high school period, you'd go to church on Sunday, sermon lasted 45 minutes on the dot, and Aunt Alvina sighed, and it was over because it was 12 uh -huh. noon. You had lunch with Grandma, and you went back to church that, after, that evening and afternoon. Wednesday evening prayer services, Thursday evening Awana services, boys clubs, and these sorts of things. So we were church people. Uh, I don't ever remember not believing. Uh, my mother had grown up in that church. My grandparents had grown up in that church. Uh, and I went to this uh, Prairie Bible Institute, which was trying to make us into missionaries. So I was steeped in the faith uh, of a very serious evangelical nature. I've I've had a lot of viewers that watch the programs who've been lifelong Catholics, for example, and they say, you know, I've been a Catholic all my life, uh, and I've been involved with the church all my life, and I never had what you guys talk about. Mm. But you sound like one that was the same way all your life in a very deeply religious, Christ-centered family and church, but do you look back on a time when a, there was an awakening, or was it just kind of a gradual reality of Christ in your life? Well, I think like many evangelicals who grew up in my environment, there's a moment where you have to decide for yourself, where you, you go from this is what the family does, this is what the community does, to having to decide. Although I don't ever remember going through any serious doubts about the existence of God or the reality of Christ. For, for me, the big dilemma uh, eventually was about Catholic Church. It was never about the existence of God. Uh, the crisis was always Rome uh, or not, never, never about God. Always. Did it start early or just yeah, much later? Not at all. So, I mean, I didn't know anything about Catholicism. Yeah. We didn't really know Catholics. We it's knew just that, with those Quebecois. Well, we, we knew there was a town, a few, a few towns over, where we planted a church to try and convert Catholics to, to the faith. My, I grew up story stories my, that my mother told about uh, taking food. This is a small town, but 300 people, farm country, far, you know, thousands of acres of farms at this little town in the middle. And my mother would tell stories of taking food to the community events when she was in high school and then needing to take it home before the dances began because the Catholics would be at the dance and you couldn't, you couldn't leave your Tupperware for the dance. Uh, so I had a cousin, maybe twice removed, who told me I should go to Liberty University in Virginia. Wow. Uh, Jerry Falwell School. Yeah. So I went there. I didn't know anything about Jerry. Um, we, weren't po we were political people, but Canadian politics. I didn't know anything about the religious right. So I arrived there in 1993. 
uh, when Jerry Falwell was, was really upset uh, about President Clinton, then President Clinton. And that was my first exposure to American fundamentalism uh, and Southern Baptist <laughs> world and the political environment of that, which was an intense time. Uh, I was on the debate team there, uh, which is what I wanted to do. I was interested in politics and political <laughs> arguments. So this seemed like, like home base after a while. And when I was there, I discovered that I was not particularly satisfied with the answers I was getting mm. about the nature of God and the nature of the Bible. And I was especially dissatisfied with what I took to be, and I was 18, you get to have 18-year-old judgments, and maybe they're not entirely fair. Uh, but what I took to be the emotionalism of experiences, um, mm. constant revival hour. And it had been something from my late high school period on where I would be shocked by my own lack of emotion in, in worship for God. Well, I never thought of that as being a serious problem. I, I knew that my teachers thought that it was a mark of lack of faith. And I never thought of it as a lack of faith. I just didn't feel very much most of the time. So when I was at Liberty, I started going to this very fine, very old Presbyterian church in Lynchburg, Virginia. And I, I never had any temptation towards Calvinism at all. I could, I could, never, I, I could, I could never go there. Uh, I, I always thought of it as, as being something that wasn't for me. But it was the first time at this Presbyterian church, Rivermont Presbyterian Church, that I heard the Apostles' Creed spoken. I'd never heard of it before. Wow. A Sunday service, the Apostles' Creed was said. And I was shocked that they used the word Catholic. And then, you know, I recoiled. I didn't say it out loud because it was printed. I, did, I didn't say it out loud. Uh, but I knew that there was something older and more stable in that kind of tradition than I had ever experienced before. And I wanted to know more. Uh, where did this creed come from? Why does it have any authority? Why do we say this? You know, it's interesting you say feel, 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 because for many of those tr that feel and believe almost mean the same thing in some of these traditions, you know. When I say believe, what's really coming out of this emotive right attractiveness to God or what you felt. And the danger of that is that when you aren't feeling it, it's gone. Well, I remember struggling with, a, you know, the question of assurance that so, so many of my community did, right? If you, if you had questions about God, that was tantamount to doubt as yeah. opposed to you're trying to understand. And if you weren't feeling anything on a Sunday or a Bible service, there was something to miss. And so just constantly this question of, was I really saved? Was I really saved? I knew I had made the decision at my mother's knee at five years old. I had said the words, but had I really? I didn't remember it that clearly. Um, perhaps I just did what I was told. So the question of assurance was a, a long one for me. And if, and if you're in an environment that really encourages to keep that to yourself, that can almost become like a time bomb, waiting to explode when you're away from home, when you're away from that comfy little environment, you go away to college and then it just... Well, I, I was telling your, your producer just the other day a uh, story of revival week at, at Liberty. Uh, we had classes cut short and they brought in the fa this famous evangelist whose name I can't recall. And his deal was only one out of ten people who thought they were Christians really were. They hadn't meant it when they had said the words. And I had grown up with the believer's prayer, right? Yeah. Jesus died for my sins. And if you said that, you, you, you were good. Uh, but one out of ten Christians hadn't really said it, hadn't really meant it. And so for on Monday night, he said, only one out of ten of you were saved. And this was a school where you had to sign a statement of faith even to attend. People are going forward to be saved. Second night, Tuesday, he amps it up just a little bit. More people go forward. By the Friday night, he says, only one out of ten of you were saved, including the ones who came forward on Thursday and Wednesday and Tuesday and Monday, because you didn't mean it either. And so if you don't come forward tonight, you are not saved. And my, my now wife, we met, we met at college, tells a story of everyone, 8,000 people in this basketball stadium going forward. They're in the bottom of the gymnasium floor. They're in the main aisles. They're in the side aisles. Everyone's just standing in their seat trying to get forward. This is, this is her remembrance of the story. And she looks to the back, and there are two reprobate, unregenerate <laughs> sinners sitting, you know, st stoically sitting. It's my friend Abe and I. <laughs> refusing to stand up for this. That is classic. Romans 10, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Sure so his explanation was, you may have said it with your lips. Well, she didn't confess it. But it wasn't, it in, wasn't here. in here. And that's the out clause for explaining 
in the world of once saved, always saved, those that go away. Well, they just, they didn't believe in their heart. Well, this was an endless debate for us. Well, once saved, always saved, or, or not. You know, so we, we, we weren't Calvinists. We didn't believe in irresistible grace or the perseverance of the saints. But we did believe in once saved, always saved, oddly. Um, but you might not make it because you hadn't really meant it. So that sense of authenticity was there. Uh, you know, though, I have real gratitude for my teachers and parents because that authenticity yeah. did bring with it a seriousness about faith. It, it mattered to it us. It brought you to Jesus Christ. It did. Brought me to the fullness of faith in time. So there you were at um, liberty being tempted to become a Presbyterian. Never tempted to be a Presbyterian, tempted toward liturgy. Oh, okay. Tempted to tradition, actually, I think I might say. Oh, well, you said liturgy. So the creed was a first thing for you there. The liturgy, too. A sense of orderly worship, the Presbyterian uh, order to worship. There was an assigned text. Uh, of course, they, they, you know, they read through, through whole books and preached through whole books. There was a sign text. There was an order to things. There was a public confession of oh. sorts. And this was all very I foreign know. to me, and very off-putting in some ways because it didn't seem spontaneous, and we believed in spontaneous prayer, not vain repetition, uh, and so on. <laughs> uh, and yet, it seemed to be something which provided stability and order. And I knew often that my authenticity was staged that it was the authenticity for my neighbor and not an authenticity for God. And so the idea of, I got to do it again, got to do it again, got to do it again, that was, that was very meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. Even though theologically, I, I was never going to go that direction. Our guest is R.J. Snell. I just got to mention that it reminds me, when I was originally ordained Congregationalist, where the only creed was, um, there is no creed. Right. It's Jesus Christ and no creed. Yes. And then I went Presbyterian, Book of Order. Sure. Book of Confessions, just like you're talking about right. this, the long collected wisdom right. of the fathers. We thought there it was uh, it's something before 1982. Exactly. It was there. But the question is, then, when you jump into that, you realize, wait, not all Presbyterians agree. Yes. Depending on which Presbyterian church. So, you're at liberty. You're getting drawn by creed. Uh, book of Confessions, uh, Book of Order, liturgy. But you're not becoming Presbyterian because not becoming up. Presbyterian. Okay. Um, going to this Presbyterian church was a very fine church, great preaching, a marvelous preacher, and a, and a holy man. Uh, Pastor Sykes, uh, his wife had Alzheimer's, and he cared for her for but years. But you would not go forward. But, but I couldn't believe tulip. I couldn't believe in total depravity, and I couldn't believe in uh, in limited right. atonement, and okay. so on. So at the same time, uh, I'm, a, I'm a young student. I'm trying to study as diligently as I can. I'm on the debate team. The intellectual life matters. Argument matters to me. And I'm studying with Gary Habermas, who is a, a fairly well-known evangelical apologist. He, he played some role in bringing Anthony Flew, the famous atheist, to, to faith. Right. Uh, and Gary was an, a, an apologist for, particularly on the resurrection and historicity of the resurrection. But he did a course on C.S. Lewis, which was my first entrance point to the Inklings. I was reading Lewis with, with, with Gary Habermas and Tolkien and, uh, and other Charles Williams I had a very intense yeah. phase for. It was very strange, of course. <laughs> but then Gary told me about this man, Sheldon Van Aken, who lived in Lynchburg, where I was going to school. Oh, who was no, He taught at Lynchburg College, okay. and he was known as a member of the Junior Inklings, somewhat self-described which included uh, Sheldon Van Aken, his, his famous book, Severe Mercy, yeah. and Peter Kreeft. So Gary gave me a copy of uh, Peter Kreeft, Sheldon Van Aken, and Tom Howard to read. And I read Love is Stronger Than Death by Peter Kreeft, and I decided on the spot, even though I was not a philosophy major, didn't know anything about philosophy, <laughs> didn't know where Boston was, uh, that I was going to Boston College to study with, with Peter Kreeft. And that's where I ended up. Yeah. Uh, I was rejected, uh, you know, because I hadn't studied, uh, philosophy. I did very well in the GRE, but I was rejected from every school I applied for, for graduate school, except for Boston College. And ended up uh, very anxiously and awkwardly at Peter Crave's door saying, I came here to study with you. I'm sure he made some wry comments about how that was a mistake. And I started sitting in on Peter's courses, uh, one after the other. My first course was with him was a course on Thomas Aquinas, which changed everything. Yeah. Did, uh, so, um, our audience probably has heard of C.S. Lewis. I'm guessing uh, the Catholic audience has heard of Peter Crave. Sheldon Van Auken, probably they didn't know that much about Sheldon with that, that powerful book about his. Did you connect with him? 
at all during this time? You, you, you know, so I'd read the books and we knew he was local uh, and, and he was he's quite a storyteller and and the story that he tells is very powerful this yeah. love affair with his with his wife Davy who then well, I don't want to ruin the story but she passes away and uh, we knew that he lived in this quaint little one room house just off uh, of Lynchburg College so I went to meet him unannounced knocked on the door and the lights on no answer and we go home and we read in the Lynchburg Gazette I guess Lynchburg Times in advance Lynchburg Times in advance the next day that he had died that the day before so I went to meet him the day he died. So never got to meet him. Wow, but he had an impact on your life. Very much so. Uh, he and his wife had this, this image called the Shining Barrier, and it was a castle with a tree inside of it. And the idea was that their love was a castle that they wouldn't let the world interfere with. And my wife and I have that image in, in our home. Wow. Okay, so you're a student at BC listening to Peter Kreeft, and it's Aquinas. That nails you. Taking Talk about that. Thomas Why Aquinas. did Thomas Aquinas? Uh, they got Catholics out there wondering. My kids have left the faith. Aquinas? Will that bring them back? How did Aquinas? What happened there? Well, I didn't know who Aquinas was. Right. I never read him before. Uh, I'm embarrassed to admit how little I knew about him. Even the reasons I took the course <laughs> were not because I wanted to study Aquinas, but I, I wanted to work, or do some work with Peter. And I discovered in Aquinas, in particularly reading Chesterton's biography of Aquinas, The Dumb Ox, three things. One was that God was good, which I hadn't really known before. Huh. Two, that the world was good, which I hadn't really known before. And three, that nature itself, human nature, reason, the world of art and literature and music, that these were good. And that if we knew the world created by God, we had access to something about God. Not, not everything, and even, not even the most crucial things, because from the world we couldn't get to the Trinity or to Christ. But we could be at home in the world, which was given to us by a Father who loved us. So the line from Aquinas, which I read it, I still have my text, underlined multiple times, highlighted at the asterisk, the mark, was grace perfects nature. Mm -hmm. I, had, had been, I had grown up thinking that the world was the same as flesh in Paul. And the world was temptation, and the body was temptation, and the world of the intellect was a temptation. You know, I, I remember as a child asking questions of teachers, and fairly or unfairly in my own interpretation, getting the impression that it was wrong to question. Mm -hmm. And that Catholic sense that there was no truth which was foreign to God, because all truth was from God, and that sense that God was to be found in the world. And with the Jesuits at Boston College, the sense that God was attempting to communicate with you, to speak to you, and everything that happened, you just needed to pay attention. Uh, but the world was good, and the world was delightful. That's, that's what I learned in Aquinas. Grace perfects nature, and I could finally be at home in the world. And I was always impressed. You know, I had no temptations towards Catholicism at the time. You know, they played bingo, they smoked, they drank, they chewed, they went with girls who do, and all those sorts of things. Um, I had no temptations to Catholicism initially, um, but the Catholics I knew were both simultaneously more at home in the world than I was, their feet were in the world, and they were more holy than I was. Neither of those, I knew the first was true. I knew the Catholics were worldly people. This is my yeah. impression. <laughs> but that they were more holy than I was was a shock. I'm wondering, it's fascinating that I think about your faithful upbringing in that Baptist, Canadian Baptist church, deep commitment to Christ and Scripture, living it out, all that you did, all the times you went all week. But out of that, you somehow miss that God is good and that we are good and that the world is good. And the reason I'm wondering is, it seems to me, if, if I remember right, that one of Pelagius's problems was that he went too far in that direction, that we're good, the world is good, and therefore we have the ability to reach a good God sure, sure. apart from grace. So if we end up in the Baptist, Calvinist way, if you will, where it's nothing we do at all, it's all grace, it's not works because we're bad. They're all filthy rags, every work. So, so we end rags. up even kind of like God ain't good or sure. the world ain't good. I wonder, was that a background to that? Well, when I was reading Aquinas and I was, I was distressed because I was liking Aquinas so much and I knew that <laughs> that way lay perdition, right? That lay way Rome. <laughs> uh, I was reading Protestants who didn't like Aquinas trying to detox myself. I was doing self-intervention on Aquinas. <laughs> 
Uh, and many of the Protestants that I was reading accused Aquinas of being a Pelagian. You know, the world was too good. Reason went too far. You could know, for, you could know from virtue and natural theology too much. And so he was a Pelagian. He was a heretic. Yeah. Um, which is clearly not the case. Right. He's not right. a Pelagian. Well, we might need to clarify that for the audience to define that thing. But, but back into the story. So there you are discovering this. Sounds like you've got guys that like you said are in there trying to point it out the clarity of where Aquinas and probably Kreeft. I mean, are they saying beware of Kreeft? Well, they, they, I mean, they liked him because he was not just a Catholic apologist, but a, a Christian apologist. Yeah. Uh, he himself is a convert to Catholicism. He grew up Dutch Reformed, always spoke very highly. Uh, he was never an anti-Protestant right. polemicist. Uh, so he was well regarded. So there's never a sense of beware of him, uh, but beware, beware of Catholicism. That was, that was very much the case. Um, I was going to, to daily mass at, at St. Mary's, which was the, the Jesuit chapel. Uh, I thought for sure I was going to hell. <laughs> Uh, you know, there were statues around, people were kneeling, they were crossing themselves, there was a priest, there were vestments, there was this piece of bread, they were parading. I mean, I was sure I, I was going to hell. And yet, after Mass, I would stay and pray, and stay and pray. I was praying more than I ever had, touched by the very ordinary, everyday Catholic folks that I met who seemed to know something about suffering, seemed to know something about prayer, who had disabled children in the service who were receiving the Eucharist as just another member of the faithful who needs God's grace. I had a very powerful experience observing for maybe the first time, at least the first time that I recall, a, a profoundly mentally disabled young man being, being wheeled up to receive at the altar and thinking, in my home communion, there was, in my home church, there was no place for this young man mm. to be an active participant. We preached, mm -hmm. we studied scripture, we memorized. He did not seem to be capable of any of those activities. If you can't hear and understand. And yet here he was and everyone was in the same posture as he was. A supplicant, yeah. begging for grace. I found that a very well, profound experience. Were you uh, moved at all by what you heard from the pulpit in most of that? Uh, rarely. Although, I, I, I still remain struck by, I always have been since my first encounter and still, with the familiarity and ease that Catholics have with the Gospels. Uh, yeah. We were Pauline people. Right. We, we read the epistles. Uh, we knew the, and, 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 and you know, John and so on, but the Pauline epistles were home for us. We read Galatians, we studied Ephesians, we read Romans, and we read Romans again. And probably Sermon on the Mount, not too much. It's Sermon on the Mount, not, not too much. Not too much. I remember realizing I did not know the Lord's Prayer as someone who had been to church multiple times a week. And Catholics again and again, obviously you read in, it's an Old Testament reading, a reading from the epistle, Psalm, went to the gospel. Standing for the gospel was a shock for me. I mean, it's all the same. Why would we, it's all the inspired word. Why would we stand for the gospel? And realizing, well, it, it is all inspired and yet this is our Lord speaking to us now. And his life matters. So I do remember hearing the parables being explained for the first time in a way that I thought, this Jesus guy maybe isn't just someone who died for my sins. Jesus Christ died for me. Maybe he also lived for me, worked for me, and taught for me. I always thought of him as a, as a sort of crude way to put it, but a death delivery system. He was here to die so yep. I could be saved. Yep, yep. He was not Born here to, to live. No, nothing to happened in those first 30 years that mattered. Would you have looked back, now? I don't want to get away from your journey, on your early days as a solid Trinitarian? Oh, to be sure. Yeah, yeah, to be sure. Um, it's not something we reflected on deeply, but right. you know, at 13, before baptism, we had to go to the pastor's office and he asked you questions and there were elders and deacons from the church who asked you questions and I was baptized in the Trinitarian formula. Yeah, I mean, when I asked that, you know, like you said, how you understood Christ, born to die, um, did, but did you have that the three in one understanding, the Nicene Chalcedon understanding? And uh, and I'm not yeah. so much doubting that, but I, as I look back myself, I wondered how many of us really didn't understand the Trinity at all, so we didn't think about it, and we prayed to Jesus, or we prayed to the Holy Spirit, we prayed to the Father. Sure. Uh, but how do you get those together? Under the... Well, I mean, there's that old, that old joke, right, that Presbyterians are really Unitarians of the Father, and Lutherans <laughs> are really Unitarians of the Son. 
Pentecostals, early Unitarians of the Holy Spirit. No, we, we, were, we were Trinitarians. I think what I didn't know, not here anyway, and what goes with this sense of grace perfects nature, the goodness of the world, I did not know Jesus' humanity. I knew his divinity, and I knew that he was here to die for my sins. But I did not know that anything happened at the wedding at Gana. I did not know that anything happened in the healings. These were signs and wonders to convince us that he was God. These were not demonstrations of his goodness, of his humanity, of his compassion. Jesus wept, we, we liked, because it was the shortest verse in the Bible to memorize. <laughs> that he was human and wept did not. You know, I'm envisioning, you know, in the Catholic Church, uh, we have crucifixes. But all, often from time to time, you'll run, run into the resurrection of Jesus. Often, sometimes not even on a cross, it's just a resurrected Jesus. And I was thinking, your church grew up, it would have been just the resurrected Jesus. Well, very few images of Jesus. We had the bare cross. You wouldn't have had a picture. But it, it's understanding Christ primarily as a resurrected. He came and died, and now it's the resurrected Christ. In, in, interestingly, what we talked about most was the Good Friday Jesus. Huh. So Jesus Christ died for, Jesus died for gotcha. my sins. He yes. died for my sins. Even the resurrection was ancillary to the story. It was proof that he was who he said he was. Uh, I remember being told that the resurrection was uh, apologetical. It was evidence that, he, that Jesus was God. The real story was his death um, because you needed satisfaction for God's wrath. All right. So there you are, uh, going to Mass, uh, going to lectures, discovering Aquinas, but you ain't becoming Catholic, right? So I do that very inventive move, which people like myself do in that moment, where they, where they discover that tradition seem, seems pretty great. And they discover that liturgy has its moments of real beauty and formation. And they're unable to go to Rome, so I became an Episcopalian. <laughs> uh, because you, there's a sense in, in the Episcopal Church that you have liturgy and you have tradition. There's a claim to the historic episcopacy. There, there's bishops and so on. So I became, uh, I was attending Episcopalian services. Uh, I was going to a very famous Anglo-Catholic parish in Boston on Sunday. Did my first creeping to the cross there um, during the three holy days. And again, the thought I had was I'm, I'm going to hell because this is idolatry. We're going to pause there, uh, RJ. But, uh, but really the point is that, yeah, from where you've come from, that's about as Catholic as you dare allow yourself to be, right? So, that's right. So there you a little more. Yeah. All right, well, we'll come back in just a second. Come back just a second for the rest of our RJ story. See you then. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host, and our guest is R.J. Snell. And uh, we uh, uh, rudely interrupted you in the midst of your journey as you've become a, an Episcopalian, which uh, I kind of hinted at, that given from where you've come from, that's about as Catholic as you would allow yourself to be. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Well, we'll get to this point, but uh, when my parents visited the Episcopal Parish for the first time, that was a larger step for them almost than, than visiting the Catholic Parish for the first time. Because <laughs> it was smells and bells and, and very high Oh, because of the high church, yeah. Very okay, high yeah. church, yeah, that's right. So as Episcopalian, um, my wife and I were, were married soon after. Uh, we were married fairly young, 23, and we were off to Milwaukee. Was, was her background similar to yours? She grew up it? Assemblies of God, okay. and we met at Liberty. Uh, in speech 101 as freshmen. I remember her speeches quite well, paid, paid special attention to those. Took uh, her a while to be convinced that I was a going concern. Well, especially if in her speeches she points out that you were one of the guys that didn't come forward for the Jesus. Oh, well, she knew. <laughs> Can't trust that guy. So we're, I had had a really wonderful time studying with the Jesuits. Um, I mentioned earlier the sense of the world being good. Mm -hmm and a sense that we didn't need to be afraid of the world. We could know natural virtue, we could study, we could appreciate art and literature and beauty. Uh, those things weren't necessarily temptations. Like all good things, they could be misused, but they in, in and of themselves were good. So I wanted to stay with the Jesuits. Uh, so I went to Marquette in Milwaukee now for a PhD in philosophy. Amy and I were newlyweds. We arrived at Milwaukee and we're Episcopalian. No money, you know, we don't have two nickels, we don't have two pennies to rub together. 
<laughs> she, at the time, is trying to find uh, a teaching job. She's just substitute gigs for a little bit, and I, I'm on a grad student stipend. But we found this Episcopalian church uh, in the very tony east side of Milwaukee, right near the lake, that needed uh, a sexton. And so they had an apartment inside the parish, beautiful old historic parish, wonderful choir, uh, where we were able to live inside the church in this beautiful apartment full of ghosts and crazy events and stories and so on. Uh, <laughs> and so we lived there for a few years. Um, and as time went on, it was obvious to me that while I loved the music of Anglicanism and I loved the tradition of Anglicanism and I loved the exposure to the sacraments, not all of them and not in their fullness, but a, a sense of the sacrament, the Episcopal Church was was leaving me behind uh, as it rejected its own its own tradition on manners, uh, not only sexual and moral, but also genuinely at the heart of Christianity, historic Jesus, resurrection, virgin birth, uniqueness of the work of God, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, so eventually, we we just were unable to stay at, at the Episcopal Church while we were in Milwaukee. Uh, Catholic Church still didn't seem like an option. You know, I, I had inklings in that direction. Uh, when it came to controversial moral questions, in my own mind, it was, well, the church says. I would read the catechism. Uh, Amy and I had, without being Catholic, concluded that the church was right about contraception, uh, that the church was right on a whole list of moral issues, but we couldn't, just couldn't go to Rome. So we're, we were going to back to evangelical parishes again. I was dissatisfied. I was angry at the end of every service. I, it was just an occasion of sin for me for several years um, because I wanted what I had tasted. I, I wanted a sense of continuity and stability. I wanted a sense of intelligence and beauty. <laughs> I wanted Aquinas. I wanted what craved had. I wanted suffering, uh, so that sense of what suffering meant. I, I wanted the disabled boy receiving, but couldn't find my way home. Mm -hmm. Just couldn't do it. Uh, interestingly, Amy was close at one point, and I was stepping back, and then I would come a little closer, and she would step back, and we just couldn't do it. Uh, eventually, I got a job at Eastern University. I don't want to make sure we get enough time. Sure. What, what, what was the big barrier to? You know, it's an interesting combination of, of cultural reality, you know, non-theological issues and theological issues. And my own theological hang-ups at the time were the ones that people in my history tend to have. I mean, the papal authority, the Marian doctrines, um, and oddly, one that I had to work through for a long time, the meaning of atonement, um, imputation of grace versus infusion of grace. Yeah. The, yeah. the Protestants that I had, had grown up with taught that we did not, in fact, become righteous. We were declared righteous. We still were not righteous, but God, as it were, didn't see it. He imputed or yeah. claimed Christ's righteousness for ours. And the Catholic understanding of the infusion of Christ's righteousness, where Christ's merits became mine, and that was that was a step that I took some time for. But culturally, um, if you're an evangelical, when you show up at church, someone greets you at the door. There's a bathroom for your children. There's a children's ministry. People tend to be happy. It's a, it's a fundamentally different experience than going to Mass. Uh, mass tends to be, um, at least in many parishes, somewhat impersonal. People don't greet you. It's quiet. People are praying. There's not chitter-chatter. It feels unfriendly. And if you're used to the evangelical expressions of worship, no one seems as if they believe in God or have a heart for God or even know there's a God because it's very reserved. It's call, response. And culturally, it's, it's quite yeah. a different experience. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad you, I wanted you to go through that because there are people here watching whose children have left the Catholic Church and went, well, what, what is it that keeps them from coming back? And some of these barriers you're talking yeah, about. Some yeah. of those things, it would be nice yeah. for someone to tell you where the restroom is when you show up with children who are crying. <laughs> you know, I'll tell this, I'll get ahead of time, but uh, the day after Amy and I decided we were going, going to cross the, swim the Tiber, and we, we went to our local Catholic parish. It was not a exemplary <laughs> liturgy. It was hot. There were no signs for the bathroom. We had a, a baby, an infant in arms, struggling and crying and wetting her pants. And there's no, you know, there's no sense that children are really welcome in this place. And I was sort of embarrassed because the child had been, you know, she was like 18 months or something, had been so, so, so naughty. 
And at the end of it, this elderly Catholic couple in front of me turned around and said, we're so delighted that your baby was here. And it, it really shattered all my sense of what was happening, um, that we were welcome here. We were all supplicants. Well, let's back up a bit. Because sure. Aren't Sorry, there quite I want to get to the good part. Right, right, right. So I'm, I'm, I finish at Marquette. I get a job at North Park University, which is an evangelical college in Chicago. And Marquette, Catholic University, didn't have a impact on it. You know, actually, that was it, it, I stepped back from the church. I was closer while I was at Boston than I was, than I was mm. at a Marquette. The, the, the church in Milwaukee at the time was uh, going through some issues. Uh, it, it was a barrier in, in some gotcha. ways. Right. right. Uh, I went to North Park was a church of the a denominational school of the Evangelical Covenant Church, mm-hmm. so Swedish Pietists, somewhat Lutheran sensibilities, but Evangelicals. Was there for five years. Our third child was on the way, and we had, didn't have any family, so we moved to Philadelphia, where I got a job teaching philosophy at Eastern University, which is a historically Baptist college, now Evangelical. Um, but with a somewhat friendly hiring policy. So there were Eastern Orthodox, there were a few Catholics, there were Mennonites, so it was somewhat of an interesting place to be. Moved to Philadelphia, settled in an old Irish Catholic neighborhood where there were processions on feast days, three parishes within walking distance, priests walking around, drinking beer during the, you know, during the feast, uh, and so on. And while there, we went back to uh, an Episcopal church. There was an Episcopal church that was relatively faithful, so we were going there, somewhat delighted to be back in the Episcopalian orbit. Of course, I'm teaching Aquinas to students, I'm teaching Aristotle to students, I'm teaching John Paul II to students, I'm teaching Humana Vitae to students. Uh, And at one point, several years in, it became again just shockingly obvious to us that we believed as Episcopalians in a paper church. We had a church on paper that connected dots. There were bishops, there were sacraments. Meanwhile, the global Anglican communion was abandoning orthodoxy or collapsing against itself. Hmm. And so my wife and I decided that we were going to plant an Anglican church, that we were leaving the Episcopal church, and we had a Rwandan bishop. Uh, The African, the Anglican African Hmm. bishops were sending missionary bishops to North America uh, because so many yeah. Episcopalians and Anglicans couldn't find faithful Episcopal bishops. And so we were planting a church, Christ, which still which exists, Christ Church Anglican on the main line of Philadelphia. <laughs> it's named for the old Christ Church, Episcopal Church, uh, right, by, right in the old city. And we were planting this church, gathering families together. And, and two things happened. One, as I, I won a summer stipend to go back to Boston College to, to study. And it was going to be great. This, this would have been in 2012. They, you had this lovely home in Newton, beautiful, beautiful home. It was going to take the family. We we're going to live in Newton. I was going to study in the library all day. We we're going to tour Boston. And about two weeks before we went, we got a call saying, oh, you can't bring the kids because there's lead paint in the home. <laughs> and liability, we can't bring the kids. So Amy and I agreed I would go up for oh, 10 days at a time and then come back home. 10 days at a time, come back home. And so... Without kids, I had all of this time on my hands. Amy doesn't like to talk about this time very much because I'm sure it was better for me than it was was for her. You know, four young kids under eight years old or, or oh, what wow. have you at the time. Yeah. And I was going, I was praying all the time. And I went to Irish Hall, which is this beautiful space in Boston College. And it has a mural on the wall of the Holy Spirit pouring wisdom out on the church. And the church granting knowledge to the various liberal arts, philosophy, theology, astronomy, geometry. And I thought, oh, this, is, this is remarkable. The second thing that had happened about two weeks before that, I was giving a talk to a bunch of my friends. I'd called them together and was inviting them to leave their home parishes, to leave their home denominations, and to join this new Anglican church that we were planting. And at the end of it, Amy and I, on the way home, were realizing we were already fighting about which book of common prayer we would use, uh, about what the liturgy would be like, about what our decisions were going to be on disputed moral and theological issues. And we realized we were creating a church from whole cloth, which of course was going to be perfect. (laughs) It was going to be perfect. Uh, And we were already fighting. 
I'm at Boston College looking at this mural and I think, that's it, I'm coming home because the Holy Spirit pours out wisdom on the church and the church disseminates knowledge to the rest of the domain of humanity. The church is, I often, this isn't, I don't mean this in a strict theological sense, but in a loose sense, I often think of the church as the diaconate to the world. <laughs> this is an odd phrase, I know it's not theologically astute, but I think of the church as serving yeah. the world with real knowledge. The church, we're told, is an expert in humanity. Jesus doesn't just reveal perfect God, he also reveals perfect man. So the church knows the human condition better than anyone. There's a great Father Brown mystery where Father Brown figures out who the criminal is and the criminal who's in disguise as a priest says, well, how did you know this? Father Brown is something of a simpleton and responds with, I hear a lot of confessions. I know how the world works. You know, the church is an expert in humanity. So I text Amy. This is 14 years of reflecting, thinking, reading, praying, angsting about the church and it ends with a text. I text Amy and I say, I'm done. Let's go to Rome. She is about to text me, this is it, we're going to Rome. She was driving in the car and saying, we're either leaving Christianity to be atheists or we're going to Rome because we cannot create a church on our wisdom. So I texted her as she was about to text me, both of us saying, we're going to Rome. And so the end of it, you know, the end of all of these years ended with a, a somewhat lame text, of coming home. <laughs> Um, so I drove back to Philadelphia. We went to this little parish in the, in the August heat in 2012. My kids squirmed. Uh, the music was poorly done, and I was home. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, let's go back to that, if you would, that image at Boston College of the Holy Spirit disseminating wisdom to the church and the church disseminating that. What happened? What happened to the, here we are in this culture today? Oh, I see. Yeah, here, here we are. Think about. I mean, you're. What is the what is the center on the university and intellectual life at the Witherspoon Institute? Is it? I'm wondering if that's probably not exactly what you do, but what happened? So Witherspoon is non-confessional, non-religious. We don't we don't do Catholic work. Right. Uh, we follow natural law. So Witherspoon engages in a variety of educational and research initiatives on the university, on the nature of marriage, nature of sexuality, all public reason, natural law. Okay. And one of the reasons that feels so at home to me is when the Holy Spirit pours out wisdom on the church, of course, the fullness of what the church teaches is Christ crucified, Christ resurrected. Th this is what we're about at the end of the day. But the same Lord who saves us is the one through whom the world has been made. And so the world, um, you know, the, the wonderful line from the Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, Christ plays in 10,000 places. Mm. The world is already infused with the Logos. The world is created by the Father through the Son according to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. All good things already tell us about God. All good things are good because they are infused with Jesus Christ. Lovely in eyes and limbs not his, Hopkins says. Um, that's what I think that that mural yeah. was revealing to me. Faith is the fullness of truth. Faith is more certain than reason. Faith tells us the meaning of existence and the meaning of all things in the fullness of Jesus Christ. And yet the church knows and teaches and encourages this reason can point to God. Sociology can point to God. Beauty can point to God. Anything which is good and beautiful and fair, think on these things. Yeah. I I remember a, a former guest in the journey home who was an atheist and then he was drawn to Jesus Christ eventually through philosophy because he had come from a relativism that there was no nothing mm. out there. But for him, the first step towards Jesus Christ was two plus two equals four. There's something that's true. That's right. It's true. It's true and it's good and it's beautiful. This is one of the things that I find so remarkable about my experience intellectually of Catholicism, but also existentially as it works out in liturgy and the faithful, is there's this old medieval notion, the fancy thought language is the unity of the transcendentals. The transcendentals are the good, the true, and the beautiful. And the medieval notion was in the end they are all the same thing. The truth is beautiful. The truth is good. The good is true. The good is beautiful. 
and the beautiful is both good and true. Modern thought doesn't, doesn't believe that. Modern thought tends to think that the good is not beautiful. Right? If something is asked of you as good, it's probably undesirable, as opposed to the saints who are luminous and resplendent with the beauty of holiness. Or the truth has nothing to do with morality. The truth is just factual, scientific world. The Catholic experience for, for, for me has been the unity of the transcendentals. The true, the good, and the beautiful are the same. If you seek the beautiful, in the end you will find the face of your Lord. If you seek the truth, in the end you will find the one who says, I am the way and the truth. And if you seek the good, in the end you will find the Father of goodness who is goodness himself and who has made the world good in his image and who delights in it and says in Genesis, it is good, it is good. Uh, and then in the experience of the ordinary Catholic life, um, the couple who have kept their child who, who was impaired because abortion was never an option, the faithful priest who, who suffers um, for his people, um, the experience has been a remarkable one for me. I, I never had the privilege of studying philosophy. I wish I did. I think at this point in my life I probably won't get there. But uh, when I think about that picture you talked about of God sharing his wisdom and then to the church and being disseminated out, it seems that that reflects if, if an Aquinas' idea of, of, uh, of, the, of the communication of the truth from God to man, God to man. And I remember reading a book by Bonaventure on the, the, the journey of the mind towards God right. where it kind of goes the other way. Right. Talk about the neat thing about where you came from, the world ain't good, but Paul talks about in Romans that no, the, the, the evidence, the, vest, the vestige right. of God is there. Sure. Can we see it from this direction? Right. Well, well the, these famous passages from Romans were a matter of some dispute in my home, the communities I was growing up <laughs> in. Because on the one hand, the pagans had a law unto themselves. On the other hand, immediately after those passages, the giving over of the mind to darkness. Yeah. And we were fairly convinced that the first part was less important than the second part. The yeah. mind was, was dark. You know, I, I always grew, in, grew up thinking that God was stingy. He was, he was not particularly good. He had a certain amount of goodness which he reserved to himself. Uh, we could besmirch God's glory and God's dignity very, very easily. You know, yeah. God, God was jealous. He was jealous, stingy. Right? Uh, and anything which we thought was good, which was not God, took away, diminished his glory. He, he had a he had hundred units of goodness and glory, and he kept them all for himself. <laughs> um, one of the things I've, I've learned from Catholicism, trying to get to the, the bottom yeah. up, he's not stingy. He is gratuitous. He's profligate. You know, behind my right shoulder is an image of the prodigal son. <laughs> the father in that story rushes out. In fact, he seems to already be out of the house looking down the road for his son. He sees the son coming from a great distance. He's looking to give, looking to share. The fatted calf, the new robe, the ring. He's, he, yeah. he's almost profligate, this God. Including the idea of mediation. I had been taught that between God and me, there was Jesus, and that was it. And the idea that in the world, or in the church, or in the sacraments, or in a priest, that any of that could be a mediation, another way that this diminished God's glory. Uh, so in Bonaventure's Journey in the Mind to God, everything in that text is so saturated with God's goodness. God's goodness just overflows and drenches that which is beneath it. And that gets so filled with God's goodness that it overflows. It's like those old uh, champagne tripods where you pour into the top <laughs> glass and it overflows. So that if you see goodness in the most mundane of things, or if you see goodness in, in the sacraments, or if you see goodness in the mediation of the priest or the teaching office of the church, that in the end is the teaching of Jesus. Or in the sacraments, that's Jesus himself. Or in the priest, that is another Christ. He's acting in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. And I always thought of that as diminishing God, and what I learned was God was good. It didn't diminish him at all. It showed how generous he really was. Yeah, I've tried to get my family and I, we grew up on this farm, that when we hear the wood thrush um, in the spring, his voice again, that's a vestige of the smile of God, yeah. to see that. Uh, and that's a way of reaching out to the world around us. Right get them to see. 
We've got five minutes left. Talk about your new book that you were a part of an editor with, if you would. You are the uh, co-editor of the book, Mind, Heart, and Soul, Intellectuals in the Path to Rome, along with Professor Robert George. Yes, yeah, so I've done several academic books. Uh, and uh, about two years ago, I was riding on the train with Professor Robert George, who's the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence at Princeton University. Very accomplished man. Uh, he himself is a serious Catholic, but is known for really groundbreaking work on natural law and bioethics and so on. Um, and I said to him on the train, you know, I think it's time that we have another book about intellectuals who've converted. I, I love conversion stories. I'm assuming you do as well, or if, if you don't, you're in the long, wrong line of work. But in my own journey, the story of intellectuals mattered to me. And the church has very few intellectuals, is, 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 is right. Intellectuals are, I know many of them. I, I am one. We are, uh, we are ourselves sometimes, and it's good that we're not all like us. But the story of a Ronald Knox that had been important to me. You know, the, the people at Oxford and the people at Cambridge, uh, the story of J.R.R. Tolkien, not all converts, of course. Um, even the story of a C.S. Lewis or Charles Williams, or Robert Hugh Benson. These stories right. mattered to me. Um, I had cut my teeth in the, those Ignatius books of the British converts yep. uh, and the French converts, the Maritains, and so on. I said, it's time for another book like that. Um, including people whose stories haven't been told, who aren't known for being converts. They're known for being scientists or mm -hmm. philosophers or sociologists. Let's, let's find those people and tell the story. So the book is 16 interviews with 16 prominent scholars and academics, uh, ranging from scientists, astronomers, for instance, to uh, professors of law and jurisprudence, uh, people at Amherst and Harvard and so on. And the interviews are done by, by several people. It's not just by, by Robbie and myself that we do our interviews, many of whom are themselves young converts mm -hmm. asking questions of, uh, of a priest like Father Thomas Joseph Wright or asking questions of Karen Oberg, who's an astrophysicist and astronomer at Harvard. So a book of interviews with converts um, by converts who have questions. Um, very often on my program, I'll have former clergy who become Catholic, and, and there are a lot of similar things that bring former clergy into the church, and maybe even fallen away Catholics come back in the church. Was there any common thread that awakens intellectuals hmm. to the Catholic faith? You know, it's interesting. When you read the interviews, you, you see many of them struggling with the questions of faith and reason, struggling hmm. with the questions of order. And yet, this isn't surprising theologically, but if you think about what you imagine intellectuals to say, the story of a lady comes up over and over again in these interviews. Uh, I, I think there, that Our Lady must have a particular care for intellectuals who ab absent maternal care would uh, continue in their folly. Uh, so the, the experience of, uh, of the Virgin plays a prominent role in many of those stories, in addition to what you might expect about is there a God and what about the Big Bang and what about astrophysics and so on. We've just got a minute and a half. I don't want to ask you a question. You talked about... Uh, sitting in that church and thinking, I'm going to hell because of this stuff, you know. And I've often noticed that people coming from very conservative, maybe even borderline fundamentals, when they come into the church, it takes a while for some of this baggage to let go. Mm -hmm. Was that true with you on some of those issues from childhood, from the faith? You know, so some Especially of, moving into a sacramental sure. economy, which is not what you had. So, you know, some of those things I had thought I had worked through as an Episcopalian. There's a liturgy. There's a tabernacle at the front. You do a communion service and so on. Uh, and yet I remember realizing for the first time that as an Episcopalian, I did not believe in the real presence of, tra of the transubstantiation of the host. I believed in a vague spiritual presence. And the idea that Jesus was there in his lonely office waiting for me, that he saw me, that he, that he heard me. Uh, my first experience doing Eucharistic adoration uh, with the monstrance and the host and seeing people not just genuflect but on both knees, face to ground and realizing oh, they mean this. This is not symbol. This, this is real. That is still a shock to me. We mean this. Yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ himself I know many, is there. I know many convert clergy particularly who, because of they were so much into the symbolism perspective, that after they convert, even years later, they're still praying, I believe, help my unbelief. Oh, sure. Lord. Oh, yeah, to be sure. To be sure. All right. RJ, what a pleasure. Thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you very much for joining us and for sharing your journey 
And again, I want to tell the audience about the book Mind, Heart, and Soul, Intellectuals, and the Path to Rome, along with Professor Robert George. I hope that's a, a, a book that would be encouraging you, and thank you again. So and much. God bless you in your service as a teacher. Thank you very much. Intellectual. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I hope that RJ's story was an encouragement to you. And again, I want to remind you, if you would like more stories like that, go to our website, chnetwork.org, where you can read not only RJ's story, but many others who, by the work of the Holy Spirit, have been drawn home to the Catholic Church. God bless you. See you next week.